Hey programmers, welcome back. Imagine this following situation. Let's say you're developing an application on the server and suddenly you start getting a lot of requests from the client, all right? Imagine you have users all over the world and suddenly your application becomes very popular. Just imagine this is Facebook back in the old days, all right? So you're thinking, all right, I'm looking at my statistics and I'm seeing a lot of requests. So it seems like my server is under pressure. What would I do? There are a couple ways you would go. First of all, you might think, okay, well, I have eight gigs of RAM on my server. Maybe I add another eight gigs of RAM. Now I have 16. So maybe my server is faster now. Maybe I also add more SSD, right? But the thing is with vertical scaling, which it is at the moment because we're going vertically high, this means you might actually hit a physical limit of how much RAM or SSD you might add. Another actual way of scaling would be something called horizontal scaling. It's obviously different than vertical scaling and it would look like this. So we take the same server and we spin up more instances of it, like one on the right, one on the left. And to be fair, this is the preferred way and the most common way that you would see application scale nowadays. Why? Because it's more flexible than vertical scaling. Okay. So let's say you still have these, well, user requests that are going up and you decide to scale your application. And now these requests are being balanced out in a way that they are hitting different servers and this central server doesn't get too much pressure. All right. And you would probably also have a load balancer here, meaning your the requests are done are not going to the servers directly, but you have a load balancer, which is a very common practice. So these requests are going to contact the load balancer. And then this load balancer actually decides how to distribute these requests. All right. I already have a video on load balancers, so you can check it out. So this load balancer now decides, okay, I'm going to route this request here. I'm going to route this request here. And maybe this very right server is actually already under pressure. So I'm going to avoid writing or routing anything there. All right. So this is horizontal scaling that we're going to be talking about. But here's the thing the the application that you're actually developing within the server, it can be a node application, it can be a Spring Boot application, whatever. You have to keep in mind that there are some best practices about this app when it's in the context of horizontal scaling that you need to keep in mind. All right. And these things are here. So let's talk about statelessness and instance stickiness. I put them both together because if you're having a RESTful API, that you're actually using, it's given that your RESTful API is already stateless, unless you toggle instance stickiness in your load balancer. What is instance stickiness? All right, instance stickiness is something when your load balancer decides that, let's see, this client request, or the, this client makes a request, and I know this client's IP, and I'm going to redirect it here. Very good. That's what a load balancer does. And now we turn on instance stickiness. And now the same client makes the another request, let's say two seconds later, and a load balancer says, All right, I made the first, uh, I redirected the first request to that server on the left. I have to keep doing it for the same client. So all the requests from the same client are going to be rerouted to the server on the left. Now, why is it bad? Imagine for some reason, for some magical reason, maybe this client is actually a web, a web scraper. It's hitting our load balancer a lot. And all this load is going to be directed to the left server, which is not good because according to the best practices of horizontal scaling, you shouldn't really, really be using instance stickiness. And you might think like, how often is it to use instance stickiness? Well, maybe you want sticky sessions. Sticky sessions is something that if you authorize the user on this server, you want to make sure that all the consecutive requests are going to the same server because you don't want to lose this authorization or, or session if, if it gets redirected to another server. All right. Or let's say you have a WebSocket connection and obviously you have to maintain the connection with the same server. So if you use AWS, it's as easy as enabling this option on your load balancer, which is an elastic load balancing service. So it's pretty easy and it's easy to get it wrong if you use it for a different use case. But here are some recommendations or workarounds for instance stickiness. Well, for example, if you need um, a session stickiness, meaning you need to maintain this client session, why not to use a distributed cache. Let's say you can use this Reddit server or Redis, Redis cache, not Reddit, and you can put it like one here, another one here, and maybe connect it to a third server that is going to take all that, all these or 
can save all these sessions for you. And then each actual server can take this client session data from this server. Okay. The second point would be simply a shared service with an API gateway. So let's say you have an API gateway, which would actually sit even before the load balancer, and it would simply authenticate the users on the way, because that's what API gateways do among other things, for example, routing the request to the right endpoint. And then you can also have a just a uh, kind of a service on the side, which is responsible solely for authentication, which you would use or usually see like it's a widespread thing. So, so I'm pretty sure you're already familiar with that. So we talked about that all good. Now let's talk about the second point that we have here, loose coupling and identifying bottlenecks. So the thing is horizontal scaling is not only for microservices, if you thought so. Thought so. Any architecture can, uh, let's say most architectures can scale uh, horizontally and vertically as well. But if you're using microservices, loose coupling is already kind of given, all right, because you're separating concerns and it's cool. But we also don't have to forget that, first of all, we need to identify the bottlenecks. Because let's say you might have a situation when the requests are going to a database from your server, and now your database is actually a bottleneck, not your servers. Let's say if, if you don't have enough space on the database, it's something that you need to take care of, why would you actually scale horizontally your servers? Servers have nothing to do with that. So you need to either increase the cap capacity of the database or do something else. So it's very important to identify the bottlenecks here, first of all. As you may already know, this kind of bottleneck have to be documented. They must be documented, especially if you work in a team of developers or in a company with high engineering standards. The reasons for documenting are different. For example, one of them is, of course, to helping future developers that are going to join your team to be easily onboarded within the project. And this leads to our sponsor of this video, Doco. Doco is an AI-powered knowledge base platform which makes it easy to build a self-service knowledge base for your customers and developers. Within Doco's workspace, you have different places where you can create your documents. For example, I'm going to create mine in my personal project. And here, with the help of the AI, you can already generate the structure of your document, be it a product documentation, developer documentation, just by putting a text. I'm going to follow a simpler way and simply create a page. And in this page, I want to describe one of the features that I'm developing for my AI project. It's going to be called a lane detection because I'm detecting the lanes of the road. It's for self-driving cars. And of course I can fill it out myself, but I'm a developer and I'm lazy. I don't want to write documentation. That's why I can choose one of these. I'm going to choose feature explanation because I want this feature to be explained simply from my code. And in my GitHub page, I have this code that I can copy. I can go back to docwo, paste it here, and I can choose the programming language that this code is written in. In my case, it's Python, and I'm going to click generate, and now we wait for the generation. After a few moments, our document is fully generated. I didn't even spend 10 seconds. How cool is that? We have our structure already, introduction, dependencies, even the usage, and of course you can extend it yourself, and there you go. You have fully written document by AI. And now we can save it and simply publish it to our documentation that lives on a custom domain. And now, as soon as everything's saved, I can see that I have an online site, and if you go there, you will have your personal documentation of the project. Doco is 100% free, go check it out, link in the description. Okay, so the third point that I also want to mention is autoscaling. And it can also be an aggressive autoscaling. Also, I want to mention Kubernetes with that. And we're going to talk about managed infrastructure. So what is autoscaling? Autoscaling is something that automatically identifies whether we need to scale our services or not. So if you ha you don't have that much pressure on one server and everything's good, it's not a, um, yeah, you don't have that many requests basically, why would you scale and waste resources and, and money? Uh, we only need to scale the services when we know that we're gonna get a lot of requests or even if you use ag aggressive autoscaling, which is kind of a predictive way of autoscaling, let's say at 6 p.m. you're gonna have a lot of users, 10 times more users. So why not start scaling our servers at 5.50 just to avoid this small downtime that users might, might experience. And hand in hand, we have Kubernetes going with it. Right? Kubernetes is great for auto-scaling and orchestrating your containers. Because if we look at the, at the settings of Kubernetes, it's very easy to configure auto-scaling, right? You just basically pass a flag, and then you can also specify like the minimum number of pods, 
and maximum number of pods to scale up to, which is great. I'm also gonna talk about it, about, about Kubernetes specifically in one of my future videos. So subscribe to not miss all the topics. And of course, manage infrastructure. What do I mean? Well, Google Cloud, Amazon, services, Azure, these cloud providers usually have managed services for that. And just make sure that if, you're, if your application go, grows big, you rely on managed infrastructure as much as you can. And the last but not least, I want to also talk about that, taking care of scaling down. All right, scaling up is easy, all right? If you cover all these points, of course, but what about scaling down? What happens if, you're, you, sh if you shut down your service because there's not much demand, but at least one user is still hanging on this server. Obviously, you need to scale down gracefully. All right, so let's take a look at some recommendations for scaling down. First of all, you need to listen for shutdown events. So when the, the process that your server is bound to or service is bound to, your API is bound to, you need to do some cleanup probably. If you're using Node.js, let's say, Kubernetes cannot just turn off your instance and, and remove the pod, all right? It, it's good to take care of the users that are still hanging within your server and then shut it down gracefully. What is shutting down gracefully? It's a whole topic on the on its own. You have to listen for a certain event. I'm gonna cover this topic in probably in two weeks. So please subscribe if you don't want to miss this out. I think it's very advanced Node.js topics that every good Node developer, uh, Node.js developer should know. And the second point is using queues. So especially if you have an event-driven architecture, I'm also gonna talk about different types of architectures, including the event-driven architecture, if you don't know much about that. You can use an event-driven architecture to put basically the operations into the queue. Let's say this is the queue and you put one operation here. And then what's gonna happen is if this instance gets scaled down, meaning deleted, at least and there's another instance that can pick up this operation from the queue, all right? So this is pretty cool. I hope you guys liked it. If you have any questions, post them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. Yeah, not much to say. I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.